Hey. Oh, thank you, because it is a little later. Hey. And don't wake the baby. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. It is. Can you remember what episode it is? It is episode 902. Is it? Was I close? You're so close. 80, 83. Five. 85. <laughs> you were very close. 85. My, uh, it's episode 85 of Alex and Jim. Mostly analyze Billy Joel lyrics, but sometimes have bottle episodes. That's right. They analyze the Great American Songbook. And a good, appropriate, uh, at least Billy Joel's involved this time. Yes. <laughs> this is like the Miley episode where I was just like, look, mostly Billy Joel, but I think Miley Cyrus is pretty. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Tony Bennett, very handsome gentleman. Huh? Handsome, uh, tall, handsome drink of water, would you say? Sure. Yeah, why not? People say. But also uh, no longer amongst us. He is no longer amongst us, but... Way to be handsome for 90-some years. He had the right kind of handsome. Well, you have this too, by the way. I'm not just saying oh, this. Very nice. You have a good, a friendly handsome for getting older because you've become charming and stuff. I think I actually look better than I ever did. I'll because, buy that. But Because there was, you know, we weren't, you know, the bar was low. But I've got kind of a charm too, and the hair is holding up, which is nice. Crucial. Uh, Crucial. Right? Yeah, yours is looking great. Gray is good for you. you you're you one of those fellows who pulls off gray. It uh, came in the right way. I have friends who, you know, had good head of hair, but then they'll get like one, like one dude I know has like eyebrows like mine, except one of them is half gray. <laughs> and it looks crazy. And it <laughs> makes it look asymmetrical. And it, it's, uh, I was like, you could fix that, but what a bummer. <laughs> I have a friend who has black hair and right in the middle, just a shock of gray. That's pretty good. It's amazing. It looks like he got it in a haunted house. Like he <laughs> saw something and then came out and that was there. <laughs> it's fantastic. Right. Like I said, I'm getting a Reed Richards, so I'm perfectly happy. Oh, yeah, you're fine then. Yeah, that's all. all <laughs> yeah, I, I will take up a pipe soon because I, I will look so good. Oh, yeah. What do you think you might go with? Um, like Sherlocky look? Oh, you think I could? How big am I a dill if I get the Sherlock? Because I, the big if you do it now, yes. If you do it in 15 years, you'll be a hero. Okay. You yeah. Know, then I think I'm going to wait 15 years. God, that would be so great. <laughs> be a very cool look. Man, I'm 100. Yeah. But oh, we have so much to talk about before we can even talk about the song. But it's episode. Yeah, you said it. Bottle episode. I figured out DeSantis's laugh. Oh, what's he doing? I've cracked the code because all of us recognize that Ron DeSantis's laugh is bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Now. Check this out. And this is not even a joke. I br I broke the code. <laughs> His laugh is the laugh of a person who has only ever laughed when at someone. Ah. He's never enjoyed a, a good joke. He's never enjoyed a ribbing at his own expense. He has only laughed at somebody falling down, being a nerd, being a... Uh, female being <laughs> in general a thing he looks down on yes oh that's good i mean it's not good but it's accurate right it's a bully only laugh yes yeah it's bothering me that people are like he laughs like a robot and i'm like no because you could fix well, the robot i think those are people who haven't we've both been on the receiving end of that kind of laugh yeah we recognize it as non-robotic yeah uh, and just yeah it's like spat at you yeah it's unpleasant it's he's definitely it's not convivial yeah There's it's no a laugh way. that is sometimes followed by a punch or a push or a throwing of eggs yeah and it's also the laugh that guys like that do 
extra loud as if to say, thank God I am not the one being laughed at right now. Absolutely. The other bullies around me, I'm going to make sure they see me laughing at that guy. Now, when I when I would get bullied, and believe it or not, I was bullied once or twice. Um, <laughs> it would bother you when somebody got physical, but to be honest, I had a surprising amount of fighting prowess. I wasn't the guy you necessarily wanted to fight if I got if I snapped. That was not good for you. I didn't like that, of course. You don't <laughs> like it when people are laughing at you when you're embarrassed. Sure. Sure. The laugh I hated the most to this day, it still bothers me, is when some schmo does an insult. And it's not very good or funny. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, and I'm not particularly insulted, but they laugh really loud because they think they were just funny. Like they just, they got you. Yeah. They, they, you didn't get me. And I, I'm more mad on behalf of comedy. <laughs> that was always the thing. You too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I knew you'd feel that way because that sucks. And then there was also occasionally you'd get the insult where you had to go, oh man, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I got to eat this one. Those I loved. That's a good Those burn. I never loved them. You were a little more masochistic than me. That but, way. I, but honestly, mostly if somebody did get you like that, wasn't it mostly always a friend? Oh, almost. Yeah, pretty much always. Because then, you know, I used to, all friends, say horrible things to Tim Bennett, and he would say horrible, but some of the funniest things. Sure. I will share one of the most ridiculous things I ever said to Tim Bennett that still makes me laugh today. And I will just warn you, it, <laughs> highly inappropriate. Okay, trigger warning for inappropriateness. And back then, also inappropriate. Right. It wasn't a different time. Yeah. So our friend Paul was doing a bit where he was doing um, an impression of um, who sings It's Not Unusual to me. Uh, uh, Tom. Tom Jones. Jones. He was doing a Tom Jones bit. And really the bit is it's not a good impression, partly. It's an excuse for him to sing. And Paul has a very nice voice. And he would wear a wig that looked a little bit like Tom Jones hair. It, sure. was, it was a pretty clever one of the many times when I was like that's only you would have thought of that and I loved it Great. and we thought of a bit where we were going to throw underwear at Paul dirt while he was doing it Sure. and so we were like we should go to the dollar store or whatever and get cheap underwear and then I said out of nowhere I do not even know where the thought came to me I said well we shouldn't actually have to buy underwear Tim don't you save the underwear from all your rapes? Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so funny. It's really good. Right? So wrong. Awful. Terrible they, thing to say. Yes. And everybody <laughs> laughed and Tim was angry. And then he started laughing. It was perfect. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> and also... Part of the joke is he would never do that every once, so no need to visit his house. Yeah, no, don't. They were made up. Yeah, this was a made, made up, wildly inappropriate joke, but wildly, yeah, wildly inappropriate. Uh, let's see. What I'm glad we put out that trigger warning. Yeah, well, yeah, God, that's just so funny that I. Uh, we also we lost Pee Wee Herman this week. We did. It's true. Did you uh, then? watch uh Pee Wee's Big Adventure again um I'd seen it recently because I just had yeah because why wouldn't you yeah um, we watched it the next day and it's just like that's so fucking great yeah you know the thing that I forgot that I loved about him is that you know what he's doing is very fun and all that but it's also a really mean impression of a kid yeah just a dick impression yeah <laughs> but like saying to a kid this is what you sound like and then making a career out of it yeah. i uh what i did binge is i binged his appearances on letterman 
Oh, great. Because I think Letterman understood Pee Wee better than a lot of people did, understood the character better. Sure. Right in Letterman's wheelhouse. Because yeah. he wasn't really Andy Kaufman eating you. He wasn't. No. That wasn't the thing. I So there's this, in Pee Wee's prime, or just his heyday when he was a new uh, character, he was on like the Today Show. And whoever was the host, or the, whoever the lady was, was talking to Pee Wee as if she was talking to a child. Oh, no. And... It was real silly and goofy and wrong. Yeah, incorrect. He's yeah, also he, such a nice testament to how unique he was. Indeed. People didn't know what to do with themselves. But Letterman realized what was going on. And I'm going to share with you my favorite, but I'm not going to do a Pee Wee Herman impression to do it. <laughs> my favorite, I remembered it. And I was like, I got to go see it again because I love jokes and you love jokes. And there's this one beautiful joke. So he's he's promoting Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And he's got a stack of magazines that are all giving him rave reviews. And so he holds up, he goes, I see I'm in Life Magazine, by the way. I'm so tempted to go, see, no, I'm not gonna do it. He's in Life <laughs> magazine, he's talking about how great it is and how you know he's holding it up and he goes, um, Time, Newsweek, he's holding uh Vogue. Playgirl, he's very excited. And Dave is just flipping through Vogue and he goes, um, now Pee Wee, I'm looking through this Vogue magazine. Uh, it doesn't mention your movie, but I, mean, I don't think there's any movie reviews in here at all. I don't think it even mentions you. And Pee Wee just goes, yeah. Uh. <laughs> and it was so quiet and they did that. They did that joke. Oh, great. Uh, Fuck the best. Yeah, and you get to get a joke like that out of that character was neat. <laughs> yeah, that is a Letterman joke. Because he's so loud the whole time, and then he's just embarrassed and quiet, which yeah. that's very kid-like. Very kid-like, and some of the best stuff. We, you know, we're watching the movie, and there is that scene where he is forced to take the tour of the Alamo, right? waiting to hear about the basement and he's so mad and impatient and quiet the whole time <laughs> and his faces are unreal yeah just the best he's so mad yeah <laughs> but like kid mad where it's like out of proportion to how mad you should be and he um, tim burton that had never directed a feature before fuck perfect right fucking perfect yeah. Got to meet Pee Wee years oh. ago. Um, he had a Broadway show for a while, you might remember. And uh, Seth Meyers' brother, Josh, was in that show. Ah. Uh. He played the fireman character whose name I forget. Um, but for whatever reason, when that show was in previews, they got us, SNL writers, a bunch of tickets to go see it in previews. And then afterwards, He's like, Josh says, you know, hang out in the lobby and I'll bring Pee Wee out to say hello. And we met him and he literally met each of us. There were like 20 of us boneheads who'd, you know, been sweating at 30 Rock all day. And he met each of us individually and did not, he did not want to talk about his show, but he had so many questions for us. And how does SNL work? And what do you do there? And what's that like? And he was sort of doing the voice, but sort of not. He was like, you know, obviously still in costume from the show. So I think some part of him was like, I'm Pee Wee. But he was also like, so it was a weird in-between voice where he was asking these questions that were like kind of little kid questions, but he was like, he definitely actually wants to know the answer to this. Because he's waiting for the answer. Um, and so I took a million pictures with everybody. It's the best. What a nice, he's yeah. So great. That's really cool. He's he said in a number of interviews that sometimes he'll remember a story, and he will he would literally have the problem of like, is that something that happened to <laughs> Paul Rubens, or is that something that happened to Pee Wee? Yeah, because he had that 
a weird life for a little while that obviously he figured out a way to balance it later. Sure. But weird to be Pee Wee, which was an all the time thing. Yeah. And and not as much room for Paul Rubens, which I, there's a part of me that thinks that the whole, yes, everybody overreacted, but there's part of me that has always thought, feel like he set himself up so he could get out. Maybe it was a definitely worked that way. Yeah. Definitely got him out. Like, when he got back in, people were then like, could see that he was an adult, a, fla- a flawed human being who right. made a character that you love. Right. And now you could just be a person, which is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It unlocked it unten- intentionally or not, it's unlocked the door for him. Yeah. And, uh, uh, one other thing I want to mention about him. Do you remember his death scene in Buffy the Vampire Slayer? I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, we could do, you don't even have to say one more thing. If we did with the whole episode, I don't care. <laughs> it was a glorious, I re- vividly, you know, you remember a good old Aaron Passmore. Sure. Just that movie, he, oh, he got so much mileage out of just quoting that movie. And that's the kind of movie you want teenagers to quote back and forth. Yeah. Together. Yeah. Good for yeah. the soul. Yeah. He could not. I meant to do that was Aaron's mantra. But <laughs> it was such a great thing. Such a great thing. Yeah. Oh, the little kicks. Little yeah. kick, kicking the wall. Oh, it really made me laugh. I had to go watch it again. Of course, everyone was posting clips all day. Yeah. And, uh, one of those days that used to be glorious for like Twitter. Yeah. Where you're like, oh, you get to just live this whole career again. Yeah. And, and pay proper respect. Yeah. Yeah. And now you can you can still do that in between Cheech and Chong marijuana gummy ads. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other one we lost, Sinead O'Connor. Yeah. I love Sinead O'Connor. Awful. Do we know what happened yet? So briefly, the word was that it was suicide. Right. But we don't actually know that. And what we do know is that the world is an awful place where whether she did or didn't is nobody's business. And then there was no real clarity. Right. It was sad. But can I just say this about the Catholic church and how much (laughs) they can go fuck themselves? Yeah. The Catholic church tweeted about her. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, first of all, I want to say that it is weird that you can say that the Catholic church tweeted about somebody. (laughs) Yeah. And it's weird on a number of ways because you couldn't say, the Jews tweeted about something. <laughs> right. Because yeah. no one's in charge of the Jews. Right. You couldn't even say Christians overall because not all Christians have that structure. Right. But you can say the fucking Catholic Church did. And huh. obviously they don't represent all Catholics, thank goodness. No. You know, they thankfully will, but can't get around the fact that they represent a lot of Catholic thought. Yes. And And they think they should represent all Catholics. Yeah. And they tweeted, you know, rest in peace or something semi nice, followed by Sinead O'Connor was a troubled, uneducated woman. Wow. Fuck yourself. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely go fuck yourself a lot. She, first of all, she was right. First of all, she was right and ahead of her time on that. Yeah. Proven over and over and over again. In your a, system a of horrifying thing to say, and also horrifying to say anything. Yeah. If you are them. Yeah, just be quiet. Nobody, you know, no nobody knows when it's shut up time. Yeah. And certainly least of all, the Catholic Church never knows when it's shut up time. White men in power never know when to shut up. It's true. And you go to an old classic white power organization that is the Catholic Church. 
Yeah, they were like, oh, you know what we should do? We should bring ourselves into this. Yeah, let's tell who. Day of. Day of sounds good. Yeah. Oh. Uh, grim. Is it? Yeah. Grim week for loss. Yeah. So, uh, what's your favorite Sinead O'Connor song? Oh, man. See, I'm not good at this game. That's okay. I'm just asking. <laughs> I will say we watched the documentary on Netflix. I'm not sure where it lives. Um, wherein they did not get the rights to Nothing Compares to You. That is, I think, the title of the documentary, but they could never play any portion of it. Yeah. And I'm so happy about that. It was like, that's the one thing I definitely have heard enough. Yeah. Um, so you got to hear lots of other songs and lots of other like just snippets of singing and you know, yeah. singing on the street, singing in a hotel room. Yeah. And all of it was mind blowing. Yeah. The voice was unreal. Yeah. And the day so like the day or two after where she was singing and people were booing her and then chris christopherson had to comfort her of all people very strange but great yeah um, whatever that song was yeah it's a bob marley song i think or that was the one she did when she tore up the picture it was a bob marley song that i forget the title of anyway that's unreal yeah but she could you know Sing me the phone book. It's anything. Acapella Danny Boy. I saw that clip. That's got to be. Danny Boy. And the thing that's, it's, I would like to say that the singing is the most touching part because it's amazing, but it isn't. It's the breathing between notes. Because <laughs> she's yeah. so present. And she just, and because she was, a, she wasn't super trained, but had a wonderful voice. So there's something so raw and beautiful because she wasn't trained to breathe the way that singers right. are trained. So, oh my God. And then uh, Emperor's New Clothes is my favorite. Okay. I love I that. Check and it out. Know. Yeah. And Mandinka, of course, is amazing. Great. And, oh, and No Man's Woman. Oh, yeah. That one I know. No Man's Woman is so great and was such a reaction to a lot of horse shit. <laughs> yeah. That one yeah. thing that well, I was like, yep. Fuck, that is great. Yeah, that's what, late 90s or something? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very sad. Very, very sad. And then in other news, still alive, did you see the Barbie movie? I've not seen it. It's doing okay. <laughs> I, I've heard I uh, uh, may have turned a profit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've I've not seen it yet. It's weird how few like spoilers there have been. <laughs> like there's not really, except for Bill Maher complaining about it. Yeah, he is in the. There's a league of white morons who yeah. clearly went into the movie ahead of time with their opinion. Oh sure. Because I looked at what he said. I've seen the movie, and I'm like, you couldn't have formed the opinion you have on the movie. If you were to say, I saw the movie, honestly, it was too much pink for me. Great. That's a valid opinion. If you want to critique certain stylistic choices, but to say that it hates men, you didn't watch the movie. Yeah. I won't give it away, but it doesn't do that. <laughs> of course it doesn't. I would never expect it to. Yeah. But those it, gentlemen they just have... didn't cater hard enough to your personal tastes. Yeah. And to them, that's a hate crime. Yeah. And it was like at one point somebody had, he had said, I feel like Ken is just there to serve her plot. And some female re responded, You're so close to noticing something. <laughs> <laughs> close. Oh. oh my God. All right. Listen, I don't know. We could talk about this forever, but I love the movie. Go see it. In, got to see it in the theater. Oh, for sure. You got to see it when it's packed. So you only have about nine more weeks left because I think it's just going to go forever. <laughs> It'll be good. I'll wear my mask. I think it's back, baby. Yay. I think oh, it's going to be happy Titanic. It's going to do Titanic numbers, but happy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we were overdue. Yeah. There's some good fucking news. 
So our uh, the great Tony Bennett passed away. So I picked the Good Life. The Good Life, which is uh-huh. not written by Billy Joel. No, although it does sound like a song he would write. It does, and I want to see if you got the same impression as first of all, they recorded it Tony Bennett style. Which yes, is, I didn't know this. I, I guess if I thought about it, I go. I guess it does sound like that. Tony Bennett recorded his albums live in the studio. Wow, like with the full. He didn't play to a recording. Great. He liked to play. He liked to sing. So the piano you're hearing, the horns you're hearing, whatever you're hearing, was in the room with him when he recorded. Great. That's okay. what it sound that way. It's different. It's different. You can feel it. It's warm. Yeah. Yeah, it's warm. It's him reacting in real time to the instruments. Yeah. Uh, it probably changes how you sing. It's got to. Yeah. There's a there's this thing crooners do, and Sinatra did it sometimes in ways that I didn't enjoy, although I love Sinatra. <laughs> uh, because in his duets albums, he would be in the room and then record all his parts, and then later the other people would record their parts because he didn't want to be bothered. Right. And so. so there's a thing he would do sometimes, or Bono did this too, where Bono does it and it's god awful. I don't even remember what song they're singing, but at some point Bono goes, Sing it, Frankie. Oh no. Oh, oh it just yeah. hurts. Don't do it. It's not natural to you. Yeah. But in this song, when Tony Bennett says, sing it, Billy, part of it is he's probably like, uh, he's not a jazz musician. He probably doesn't know when to come in. Hey, <laughs> it's your turn. Absolutely. That's like the origin of why dudes do that. I'm sure. Yeah. Because Especially in olden times, I'm sure they were like, Hey, you guys are doing a duet. Go in the studio right now. Don't look at any notes. And yeah. and I'm sure there was a lot of like having to figure it out. Yeah. Like take it away. Yeah. It's, it's, the part with the highlighter is over. Yeah, it's yeah. It's <laughs> less, you should have highlighter. It's less <laughs> jarring time. than just going. It's your turn. It's your it's your turn. I think that's basically what it is. But I want to see if you thought the same, or I'm going to give you a hint. He, I don't think he's doing an impression, but Billy Joel, when he's singing in this song, sounds exactly to me like a guy who is alive now that you know who wishes he was a crooner. You <laughs> ah, now I have to listen to it again with that ear. Um, he's Canadian. <laughs> oh, he's Canadian. That's who he sounds like is a Canadian you've met who really kind of wishes he was a crooner. Well, I haven't met Buble. But the but who wishes he was a crooner, not a crooner, he's more yeah. of a comedian. It's more of a what? Comedian. Oh, more of a comedian. Paul Goebbels Canadian? <laughs> Uh, and very famous, you've met him. Oh, wait, which one? Oh, no. I don't think I know what you're talking about. Wait, are you talking about Seth MacFarlane? He's Martin Short. Listen to him. Wait a minute. He sounds like Martin Short doing a crooner character. Billy Joel does. He sounds like the crooner character's name, Martin Short's character. Jackie something? Jackie Rogers Jr., yeah. Yeah. All right, now I gotta listen to it again. Wait, I can do that right here. Yeah. No, I, I, no, I was gonna play the the song and it took me to an Amazon link. <laughs> Fuck that. I'll listen to it later. <laughs> Very funny because it jumps out at me at this one part where he's just Billy Joel is, be, and to his great credit, this is not his genre. No. He's just sounding like the way he imagines a crooner sounds like. Or he's very much just like, I'm oh, just do it like he did it. Yep. I'll get as close as I can to that. It's the good life. Oh, it's so great. 
<laughs> he um I would credit to Billy Joel, by the way, who could have put out an album of this kind of song and sold it to 50 million moms. Yeah. And all kinds of money with like American standards that he had no business singing. Yeah. And he's like, nope, I won't do that. Yeah. I'll do like uh fucking classical music that no one will buy. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that'll mean something to me. Yeah, well, you know, Billy Joel, we we make fun of Billy Joel, but the man's an artist. He really is. And um, he, to his credit, I think he gets embarrassed about the right things. <laughs> More so as he gets older. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, did you, you must have seen um, Alec Baldwin's impression of Tony Bennett many times on SNL. Fantastic. Great. Really great. Great. The, the just making use of the word great yeah so great 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 show <laughs> yes that was one of the ones because by the by the time it came around this had become so trite on snl that you get sick of it but in this case seeing tony bennett on the tony bennett show with tony bennett was wonderful it was wonderful i mostly <laughs> got sick of it overall because it had become this thing to help really unfunny guests look okay. Look, you gotta have those. <laughs> but, yeah, you do. It's a real necessity. <laughs> or don't willingly let go of a device like that if they have it. <laughs> oh yeah, and it's it's easy, it's cheap, it's fine. Awesome. Vinny Vedecci. Yeah. Church lady, like just yep. you just go on there. Yep, <laughs> that'll yeah. get us six minutes closer to the end. Yeah, Alec Baldwin. It, a couple of his impressions were great. His Trump was terrible. His Trump couldn't have been worse. I don't know what he was. It, yeah, miserable. And I don't know why that had to linger so long. He hated doing it, I think, but more would hate it more if somebody followed him and did it better yeah this is how much i didn't enjoy that i think that that's the worst thing he's ever done it might be the worst thing he's ever done including rust wow no, see, that's <laughs> rust burns oh that movie think we'll ever see that movie i think uh it'll come out yeah yeah I think when something like that happens, there's like some, you know, some white vulture who is like, people will go see it. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Ugh, ugh. It'll be really annoying if it's good. Right. <laughs> It'll just bum you out. Yeah. It's already kind of a bummer, but you know, like, ugh. yeah. I mean, obviously, there's at least one scene in that movie with him holding a gun. So that won't be any fun to watch. Is this the one you'll think? Yeah. I, well, then I wonder if this is the day of. Yeah. Maybe. And right, yeah. The best. What if the best take just includes a little bit of him going, uh, just a little bit, like <laughs> I had to cut it. <laughs> They're like, oh no, that's even the take. <laughs> just kept it all in, and rewrote the second half of the movie. Yeah. Oh, that cinematographer was trying to kill him. <laughs> the rest of the movie is made with like paparazzi footage pieced together. <laughs> Tom oh, Burton was a western. <laughs> Just steps out of its own reality. So this song is out of the American Songbook. It is the a good, good life. life, which I'd never really listened to before. Not what I thought it was going to be like lyrically. I, it's interesting. So one observation I have just going into the lyrics is this. Isn't it funny how hard it is to write songs considering how much territory has been covered? Yeah, man. Songs. Yeah. But I really like this song. I think I always have. I like it lyrically. I like what the American Songbook did. I, I like the way people wrote songs back then. It's from the movie... Seven Capital Sins, if you remember that. Nope. 
Nope, nobody remembers that. It was the rest of its time. <laughs> That's right. Everybody got shot on that one. <laughs> um, so I'll start. Uh, I was, so the other thing is I like lyrically a lot of old songs were written like the way I like to write poems. When I think of writing a poem, I I don't re- just write poetry. I usually have a hook like that gets me into, okay, this will be the hook of the poem. Because I like when I write poems for somebody to go, ah, I like to have that kind of a moment in a poem. <laughs> All right. I, Fair I, enough. I, you know, which is maybe, it's almost like a cheat, but just I'm not secure enough to just go willy-nilly just write stuff. I have like, you know, like I have to have a little hook. Like I wrote this one about the moon. Like something that comes back. Yeah. So my hook, I wrote this one poem called um, Sponge Moon. And in it turned out it was about how the moon probably resents all the uh, romance and sorrow it um, gets blamed for. Nice. And then the end of it was, so let us forego the moon and be responsible for each other was the crux of the poem. Nice. Slightly better words than that. Not even much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll start. Start it uh, up. This is, oh, and it's intro. It has an intro. Older, older songs always had the intro. Right, uh, because the band's right there. Yep. In the studio. And, and so that's why sometimes you'll hear a version and you'll go, Hey, didn't was there another part? It's because sometimes you'll forego the intro. Um, oh, the good life, full of fun, seems to be the ideal. Mm, the good life lets you hide all the sadness you feel. Perfect. Perfect. And then also, that's when I was like, oh, this is not what I thought it was about. Yeah. Because in my head, I didn't remember any of the lyrics, really. And you've heard like, oh, we're going to talk about a song called The Good Life. And I'm like, oh, I'm sure it's like, oh, The Good Life. It's so great to have this good life. And The Good Life is great. And I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I got money and I got, yeah. I expected very little depth of thought. And I was like, oh, it's uh, it's very... um, There's some psychotherapy (laughs) going on. Yeah. Um, very early for that. Well, and you know what? You're right. It is the kind of song Billy Joel would write. It definitely would. A little bit. He would. There would just be a little, at least one verse where he's yelling at you. Yeah, it's the good life, but uh, you only like it because yeah. you hide your sadness, you jerk. Yeah, it's the good this life. This is what y'all do. <laughs> this is what you should do. <laughs> uh, also, there'd be motorcycles. Uh, yeah or sound effects yeah um i think it's you um uh, one other thing i wanted to say is that just the phrase the good life is so uh monolithic yeah but it means something very specific um it doesn't mean any version of a good life or, you know, what you and I would consider having a good life. It really is about wealth, <laughs> the wealthy life. It's the guest life, um, which also didn't quite occur to me until I was thinking this. Oh, that is how it was used at the time. A hundred percent. This was difference between a good life and the good life. It was poor sucker working nine to five, wishing he was a Rockefeller. Yep. Wishing he was living the good life. Yeah, on a boat, it's it's Tevia, you know? Yeah. It's a, a La Dolce Vita. Yeah. For our Spanish-speaking viewers. We are we are some cultured sons of bitches. Sing it. <laughs> Sing it, Billy. Sing it, Billy. <laughs> you, you won't really fall in love, or you can't take the chance. So be honest with yourself. Don't try to fake romance. Don't be a liar. Could lift that right out of an actual Billy Joel song. Yeah. It's solid advice. It's actually, you know, it's, it's, it lyrically feels partly like, hey, okay, you're this way. Don't hurt the other person. Right. (laughs) Enjoy your good life, but don't fucking be a dick about it. Yeah. Don't leave behind. Don't kid yourself. Yeah. Don't leave carnage behind because you have to play games. 
That's wonderful advice. Wonderful advice that no one ever takes. I saw a few ladies. I know. Okay, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and and look at the repetitiveness works so well. It's the yeah. good life to be free and explore the unknown. And let's stop for a second. It's the good life to be free and explore the unknown. That's a nice sentiment. Yeah. Followed by like the heartaches when you learn you must face them alone. Oh, oh, the sad, yeah, the sad, wealthy, lonely guy. And yeah, I'm I'm having this great vacation. I'm, I go wherever I want to go. I spend time with ladies. They don't know me. And if I'm sad, it doesn't matter because they can't help me because I ain't let anybody get to know me. Right? No one will ever see me sad. Ah, that's wonderful. Really great. Oh man, I'm I'm all about that lyric. That lyric will break your heart. And uh, the Sinatra version is good, but honestly, I think any version by Tony Bennett happens to be. It's very good that they did this because this happened to be one of my favorite songs from Tony Bennett. Any version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rightly so. Yeah. And I'm glad Sinatra didn't quite connect with the intention of the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, you can be sure about that. Like half of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What does it say here? Okay. Start the music. Yeah. Please remember, I still want you. And in case you wonder why, well, just wake up. Kiss the good life goodbye. That's your wow. lyric. Not a lot of lyrics in the song, by the way. No, I mean, lots of punch, though. But plenty. Yeah, a good lesson to be learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good lyric shape. Please remember that I love you. And in case you wonder why, I guess the good life goodbye. That's such a nice thing to say. Guess the good life goodbye, of course, means say goodbye to what actually all that loneliness. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, the good life is not good. <laughs> it's not the good guy in the song. And all joking aside, I mean, I'm right. He does sound like Martin Short, but that no, I'm sure if he was doing a Martin Short impression, that would be the greatest thing in the world. I just think it's a coincidence that that's what two guys who imagine a crooner. But actually, you know what? That's not even a surprise because you and I at karaoke, when we're imagining being a crooner, we do that. Yep. And Billy Joel just happens to be famous and it's really jarring because he's singing opposite Tony Bennett, <laughs> gets this music like like nobody else, really. Yeah, I'll you know I'll bet they rehearsed it a few times, and then Tony Bennett was like, "I better say, sing it, Billy, so they'll know it's him." <laughs> yeah, and they won't think it's me singing weird. Man, I had this conversation with Graham. Um, about music, Graham Elwood, funny comedian. And I was mm -hmm. talking about getting a lot of work. Yeah, he's doing great, by the way. Very nice points of view. <laughs> when we were, when you and I were young, or particularly me when I was young, I had a very regimented idea on what comedy should be. So talk about comedy yeah. for a second. And then there would be one or two times when I would see a comedian or a piece of work that was different than what I was used to. And my mind went, um, oh, yeah, it could be that. Yeah. And my stand up, what I do now, very proud of what I do now. What I did then was fine, even not then then because I was young and stupid, but good stand up I did before. But now is different because. I'm open to the idea that it can just kind of be anything. Right. I'm open to how beautiful it is when it's just stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, I can be that. I like broad comedy. I like, you know, I like really precise. Doesn't matter. Yeah. But I'm not a musician, of course. Musicians do that too. Tony Bennett did that more than anybody. Yeah. If he met a musician from any genre, he wasn't kidding. He loved them. Right. 
And so when he was performing with a country singer, when he performed with Diana Kroll, another kind of different kind of jazz singer, and when he performs with Billy Joel, you guarantee, you're guaranteed when Billy Joel came in the room, Tony Bennett loved him. Yeah, and probably knew. Like knew his songs, knew his stuff. I yeah. feel like probably listened to a lot of people. Listened to everybody just because the man loved music, loved performers, loved jazz, loved blues, loved country. There wasn't a genre he didn't like. He probably wasn't a big death metal fan. But I bet you if they were in the room doing some song, he'd just go, oh, that's great, great, great. He would, he would, and he would mean it. He would mean it. Um, I've got to see a lot of this kind of interaction at our show because we will always have at least two guests yeah. sometimes more and they won't necessarily be compatible in terms of what they do yeah but you will see once in a while guest a will go over to guest b in the green room and say like hey i really like that show that you're doing my wife and i watch it all the time and there'll be a lot of back and forth and you really appreciate seeing that yeah not just that they watched that show, but that they were like, oh, I'm going to go tell that dude. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember who was on our show. There, We had some band that was like, maybe had a, their first hit single, if that, like very young band. And we had, hey, Sue, the producer. Oh, I think she might be asleep. I think it was... Well, that's a write-up. Mariska, yeah, that's a write-up. That's first warning. <laughs> Might have been Mariska Hargitay, someone like that, an older female actress who said, went over to this band and heard her saying, hey, uh, I heard you guys were going to be on the show tonight. So, like, I'd never heard of you, so I, like, bought your album <laughs> and I've been listening to it all day and it was really great and this is my favorite song oh. and I think you guys are going to be a big deal and it like it was great that's so that's sweet zero obligation to do that but it's nice when people are like let's see what this is yeah it's right here i you know i have the opportunity and the access yeah and also it's a, a a nice uh version of knowing who you are and like oh then if i go say this to them that will mean something yep. so i should yeah um, you know feeling some sense of obligation to these fucking British kids or whoever they were. Yeah. Have um, I told you about the thing I said to Al Franken? I did. Uh, tell me again. I just, it's, it's a version of that because uh, the movie um, Stuart Saves His Family had come out. It was a long time ago. And <laughs> I saw him and I wanted to make him feel good about it. And literally, I didn't do this on purpose. I go, I saw the movie I liked it. <laughs> Great. Not the good, not the best version of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And he did the right thing. He walked away. I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you're right. You are right, sir. Right. But, uh, yeah, I yeah. love watching musicians with other musicians. It's such it's a neat Always world. interesting. Yeah. Taylor Swift, by the way. I like Taylor Swift fine. I like her music fine. What a wonderful human being. Did you see what she did with her tour? No. Which thing? She said so many things. I know. Like, well, she made money hand over fist, of course. Sure. So she gave the truckers like a $100,000 bonus. Yes, I did hear about that. It was Great. Like, That's what you do with money. Yep. Yeah. If the AMPTP is listening, that's yeah. what you do. You want another Barbie? It, AI ain't gonna give you another Barbie. It's not gonna give you an Oppenheimer. Nope. It's not I mean, even. It might literally give you an Oppenheimer and kill us, but it's not gonna. <laughs> it might be Oppenheimer. Yeah, it might be Oppenheimer, but it ain't gonna give you. Uh, you you want to, by the way, I'm sorry, you guys, for your own mental health, go see Barbie. And I'm not joking. Go see it. It's so beautiful. On the case. And my favorite part. The movie's great. This will not spoil anything. My favorite part was looking around 
at the daughters and the mothers and the girlfriends with girlfriends and the friends with friends who clearly had way too many mimosas. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Who dressed up, I'm sure, a lot of people in pink. Yes. And Great. As it should be. And listen. The events, man. I am an easy cry. Of course, I cried. <laughs> when don't I cry? But it was so, so many levels of reasons to just be joyful. Fucking fantastic. And my only negative review of Oppenheimer is I'm in my 50s. I'm not going to watch a three hour movie. I got to pee. Yeah. Put something in there. Put in intermission. Yeah. This is the only dumb joke I came up with about it, which was, I got to pick a space to pee. So I think I picked the right spot. But just out of curiosity, wasn't there supposed to be an explosion in this movie? <laughs> oh, great. That's kind of the joke, I guess. Yeah, man. <laughs> I came back from the bathroom and everybody was dead. <laughs> <laughs> What's that about? Yeah, Barbie's fantastic. It's just so fun. I will go see it a number of times in the theater because I just want to see it. <laughs> and I'll, you know, I don't, I don't want to watch it small. I, I will later when it's like, oh, it's on. But yeah, yeah, man. Um, now, fair warning to our regular listeners: uh, yeah. this week's clue is tough. So if Alex don't get it, it's understandable. If he does, that's impressive. So to start with, no hints. And they were so gung-ho to lay down their lives. Really? Nicely done. I fucking love that movie. <laughs> you nailed it. That's great. Gung-ho. I thought it was e it was either going to be you got it right away or you never did. I'll tell you, I was worried for a few minutes because I really thought that was Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> oh, very funny. It was very much not. Oh, that is very good, sir. Wow. That makes me happy. That oh. really does. Fuck. What an era when we were first nervous about Japanese car makers. Right. <laughs> was going to be the thing that destroyed our country remember that yeah my favorite oh. yeah my favorite scene in that movie i also love that movie is part of the plot if you've never seen the movie please do watch it but um spoilers it's too late they'll send shut up um but there's a part where the american company to stay in business has have to produce to meet a quota and if they don't meet the quota so they are rushing things and one of the cars doesn't have a windshield on. <laughs> and uh, our main character, um, what is his name? In real life. Uh, uh, fucking, now I can't remember. <laughs> Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. Oh, that's the guy. Michael Keaton goes and pretends to clean the windshield. The it's best. so funny. And it's so... One of the things, him in his prime, how funny he could be in a thing like this. Unbelievable. Yeah. What a career, what a career on that guy. We should talk about that. Dude, yeah. I, I wish The Flash was a good movie. Yeah, you know, look, I'm still stuck on uh, Dope Sick. How great was he in Dope Sick? Yeah. He, dude, he's pretty great. Yeah. Um, the, that uh, Birdman thing. Birdman thing, great. He was uh, great in an episode of um, Documentary Now. Yes, he was. <laughs> What's weird about him? Have you seen his stand-up? I feel like I must have at some point. It's so good he got out of stand-up quick. <laughs> because I remember how funny I found him, but he was a little bit Dane Cookish in that in oh, respect, yeah. you're like not in any of the bad ways. <laughs> like, <laughs> Cook, in the sense that he wasn't the best writer, but he had great energy and delivery, and it carried him really far. Oh yeah, but it wasn't going to carry him farther. Although Paul Goebel and I used to have this joke, one of our favorite jokes of his, he did on Letterman, 
which was, he said, you know, when you go to the movie theaters and you try to act like you're still underage so you can get the kids' prices? Uh-huh. Still like, and I would tell my, my friend is always a nervous liar. So it was like, um, just remember, you're, not, you're, you're under 12, you're under 12, you're under 13, you're under 13 or whatever it was. And, uh, but the ticket guy goes, how old are you? And he goes, one. <laughs> Great. That's a funny <laughs> joke, funny joke. But yeah, he got into movies right away and never went back. No, nor should he. He should nah. do four movies. Yeah. If yeah. anything. God, he's the trivia best. for me, mister? Um, all I got for you is uh, Tony Bennett and Billy Joel did perform this song for a final time live. What event? Oh. Where and what event? I'll take the year also. Was it uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Parade? It was not. Oddly, you got the right city. Okay. Um, uh, was it the anti-Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade counter-programming? They make a point of how they hate it. That's right. They were on the other side of the street. <laughs> yeah. And then they go, i tell you what's great about this. No fucking balloons. Billy Joel and Tony Bennett, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's the good life. Drowned out by parade like People music. who aren't paying attention are like Martin Short's here. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow, he got fat. <laughs> it was uh, in 2008, the last play at Shea. Dude, very cool. Right? Yeah. So, I had no shot at that. No, I know. That was not fair. But it's reasonable. You, I gave you a hard one, although knocked it out of the park. The best. Um, I kept mine right in the park. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a pretty, like... The trivia questions, it's getting thin out there, man. Oh, yeah. It's it's going to get either incredibly hard or just the answer is going to be Billy Joel. <laughs> right. Some call him the Piano Man. Who is this famous rocker? Uh, the, the song Piano Man is references a particular musical instrument. <laughs> <laughs> or it'll just be, what are all the lyrics to We Didn't Start the Fire? <laughs> <laughs> oh. did you listen to the uh, fallout boy version I sure did i sure did what do you think i like it and then i read opinions about it because i i don't know i've become i think maybe i don't know if this is an old man thing but i love reading a bunch of opinions after i see a thing yeah same i and, think it is an old man thing yeah and i enjoyed i enjoyed the song a couple of them were like, it would have been better if somehow they managed to have them in order because the Billy Joel one's in order. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, is it? Because I've never thought about it before. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I absolutely, no critiques because saying, you could have done this better seems silly. You did well enough. And what were you doing? You were covering a Billy Joel song. What What am I going to ask you for? Yeah, exactly. I agree. I and, think that uh, sounded good musically. I thought there were some real clever moves like Michael Jordan 23 and Michael Jordan 45. I like that a lot, yeah. Now, that, don't you feel like the reason that song almost had to exist, a sequel, is because of 9-11? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, because that stuff like that makes it jarring where you're like, oh, right, stuff has continued. And uh, somebody wrote, and I think they're right, that somebody else needs to do this song again in two yeah. years. And I'm I, like, yes, keep doing it. Yeah, well, I feel like the whole thesis statement of the song is shit keeps happening. Yeah. So just have one song from 20 years ago. Yep. It flies in the face of the thesis. you got to keep refreshing it. By the way, it makes it progressively kind of a sad bummer because we didn't light it, but we tried to fight it. They failed. Every yeah, time. every time. 
It's a song about, it's a tragedy. Yeah. It's a song about a society failing to get better. It would be great if... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the kind of thing that makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Tried and failed. I hope in 200 years there's a version that's just like um, nobody got sick, everybody's fine, everyone's got food, everyone. We didn't start the fire, but we put it out. And now there's no fire. But now we're all bald and we're dressed in silver. With the V, what's the V for? Right? Seinfeld. <laughs> Why the V? Finally, yep. Oh, that's hey, just fucking great. Uh, it's your turn. Hey, by the way, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I, I'm circling it for my choice next week. I realized, unless you happen to pick it, there's a big Billy Joel song that somehow we haven't picked that's even one people know. Fantastic. And it's not We Didn't Start the Fire. Nope, although you could pick that at some point. Well, I don't think it's the one I'm thinking of because I'm going to pick State of Grace. I love it. State of Grace. And that'll be episode 86. Let me write that down. 86, baby. Fantastic. Yeah, that would be a deeper cut. Yes. But that's great. Let me circle this because I'm going to forget. <laughs> you know, and the you know what I'm gonna do at the end of this episode for all of you, if you stick around to the end, I'm gonna link to Sinead O'Connor's Danny Boy. Oh, great! I'll tell you really quick, and then we'll wrap it up. But Danny Boy to me has been a song that I've always only heard satirically. Yeah, it does come up that way an awful lot. And it's the only way I think I've ever really heard it is, isn't oh, it's, this a funny example of the, this kind of song? Or it's like used in films to indicate that a character is drunk. Or, yeah. And I'm an Irish lad. And I heard, I was listening to Sinead's version. And I got to say, I think I heard her version when she was young, when, when I was younger. And I was too stupid to stop and listen. Yeah. I was too whatever. I listened to it. I cried. I got it. Yeah. I'd, I've never gotten it. And it just washed over me. And I had a good couple days of ruminations about my mother. Oh, wow. And I hadn't thought of the good lady in those terms in so long because she's just been gone forever. Yeah. And I had flashes of her drinking coffee at the table. I had flashes of her cooking for me, smoking, being an older lady, sewing, um, things, you know, divorced from the other parts that weren't great. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I was all together. She was a good lady. And it was nice of Sinead O'Connor to remind me of that. It was nice of Barbie to remind me of how many good women there are in the world. Yeah, man. God bless you, ladies. You put up with a lot of crap, including idiots like me, who, when I was young, made a hilarious joke to Tim Bennett. Right? You should. <laughs> if you remember that joke. 